Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today, we're continuing in the study of the book of Acts. And I think this is the fifth video. Um, so part five. Um, we started, of course, in the beginning with Acts chapter one, verse one. And, we, and now we're on Acts chapter four, verse 20, I think, is where we're picking up today. But so if, if you didn't watch the previous studies on this, uh, please go back and watch it all from the beginning. Uh, however, uh, uh, we're going to um, probably make plenty of references back to some of the ground we've already covered before. But um, before we get started, just let me ask Brother Joe just to say hi to everybody. Yeah, this is uh, Joe, and I'm with the Sebastian Dresden channel, and uh, uh, a, a channel mainly for fellowship and, and learning, and uh, enjoying the study. I think uh, Luke will probably give a, a 30 second or a one minute synopsis of how we got to where we're at. And I think we're continuing uh, Acts chapter four, if I'm not mistaken, we're around verse 18, somewhere around there. Uh, back to you, Luke. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I should uh, give a, the, so far, now the book of Acts, when we first introduced the book in the first uh, study, uh, giving a summary of what the book's about, uh, uh, we, we made the point that the main character in the first half of the book of Acts is Peter, and the second half is Paul. So at this point we have, I believe we've had four sermons by Peter. Uh, and, and each one of these sermons have gotten two reactions. One is conviction of the, of the audience where they, they really felt convicted that we were wrong in rejecting Jesus. We repent of that. And now we are embracing Jesus as the promised one, our Savior, Messiah. And, and then the, the other reaction is the, the Sanhedrin is per, primarily, uh, they react by wanting to you know, jail and beat and threaten the apostles to never preach in that name again. So that's where we are right now. Uh, anything else you want to add to that uh, summary before we get going? No, that was a that was a real good summary. I think people can uh, uh, follow from that point pretty easily. Okay, uh, we'll begin now at this. Uh, I I like to read it first in the KJV, and then we. We might look at the Amplified sometimes uh, if we need any more insights. Um, so Acts chapter 4, verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. This is still Peter responding to the, uh, the, the Sanhedrin uh, who threatened him to no longer preach in the name of Jesus. And um, so Peter says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Uh, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. Uh, for all men glorified God for that which was done. Um, let me ask you, um, you know, when I, whoever responds first is kind of under the pressure to give your first, be the first one to give their thoughts. And, and so if, if you, if you want to go first, that's fine. If you prefer for me to go first, I don't mind either. Which way, which way do you prefer brother? Uh, I prefer to have all the pressure on you, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'll take my turn and you went first last time. So I'll give you my thoughts on, on these verses here. But, uh, uh, so uh, again, Every time the apostles are threatened by the Jewish religious leaders, told you better stop preaching in Jesus' name or else, uh, Peter and John's uh, answer is that uh, we're not going to stop. We, we, we're not going to obey you instead of God. Um, and, and so um, at this point, it says that they, uh, they threatened them again, but they let them go because they're finding nothing how they might punish them. They, they couldn't figure out how and what grounds they could punish them because of the people, all the people who are witnesses. This goes back to, you know, maybe the earlier chapter or the beginning of this chapter where they healed a man that was lame from birth. 
and all these witnesses saw this and this this miracle uh, led a lot of people to to believe that um, these apostles were uh, men of God delivering a true a true message about Jesus and so they became believers um, because of all the eyewitnesses a lot of people were uh, saw what was done and now they're actually believers and, and so for that reason the religious leaders felt a little bit helpless as to, you know, they, they couldn't really punish uh, Peter and John. This says, for all men glorify God for that which was done. Uh, I think that's a reference to all the men that have, were at the scene who's witnessed all, all these uh, things. Uh, what do you say about that? Well, I think, that, I think there's very little doubt that if they, they could have uh, flogged them or killed them, they would have. Uh, they're... they're uh, no different than Christ was at this point, uh, threatening uh, the power base that, that they have established. You know, they're preaching uh, the name of the guy that their leaders just had crucified. And I don't think it's any secret among the people of Israel uh, who are all gathered for the Pentecost feast here in Jerusalem, that, uh, that they indeed were the catalyst behind Rome crucifying Christ. And now here are Peter and John showing up uh, at their front doorstep, uh, witnessing uh, that uh, your leaders have been the catalyst to crucify uh, the Messiah. And here's proof he was the Messiah, and thousands believed on the spot uh, because of one healing. And so uh, these Pharisees, Sadducees, and lawmakers, priests, uh, that's, the, that's the, the top of the government for the state of Israel at that time, uh, outside of the appointed king from Rome. And so they're real nervous, and uh, they know that if they let him go and they keep talking, uh, they've got nothing but uh, potential revolt on their hands by the people. So uh, they're a real nervous crew here. And, uh, and I noticed that it says that they didn't know what to do because the people outside had seen this miracle, and everybody, whether they believed or not, evidently, was recognizing the miracle of uh, the healing of this lame person that everybody knew. So uh, really stressful times uh, for the leadership of uh, Israel, and, and they're uh, no doubt very, very nervous right now. Back to you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's also important to kind of review a point that we covered before, and, and that is, what is the content of this sermon of Peter? In, in, in all four of his sermons, he, he preached the same message, and, and that, that is that, uh, the, the gospel, uh, that the gospel that many people credit to, only to Paul having the true gospel, and yet we see Peter here, the first sermons preached in the New Testament church are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That he died for our sins, and that that's why he died, and that it was for their sins, and that and that uh, they needed to believe in him and, and uh, change their mind about uh, the, the fact that they rejected him and didn't believe he was the the promised one, and then the the resurrection that they're eyewitnesses to it, and that's the proof that he truly was the promised one, um, and the. The, the, they they called him the Messiah and the Christ. Uh, we we know even more now that he is God manifest in the flesh, the Son of God, the Savior. So uh, they did preach the same uh, salvation message that that we are preaching every day here. Uh, so uh, that's the message they preached, and it's been the same. Every single sermon has really been the same. Um, before I go on, anything else? Yeah, it's important that uh, people realize that Peter uh, may not have fully recognized what he was preaching. I think that uh, we established or, or, or uh, guess that uh, Peter's speech or sermon, sermonette, was very much like Stephen's, uh, where the Lord uh, breathed through them the, the words that he was speaking. And uh, while he did speak the truth, he may not have been cognizant of all of the details because he'll be later uh, surprised 
by by the uh, inclusion of Gentiles in into the uh, into the fold. So uh, I, that's that's important enough too. I think back to you, Luke. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. I'll, let me read further now. Um, verse twenty-two. For the man was about 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Uh, and, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that, is, that, all that in them is. Um, well, I, I think I'll stop at that point there. Uh, the, the, the idea was, uh, it seems that there may have been other people with Peter and John, uh, but Peter and John are specifically mentioned. We know that John is the preacher. Uh, jo I mean, Peter is the preacher. Uh, John is there with him. Um, maybe it's like, um, in the, in the street preaching I've done where, Usually, I, I always tried to model my street preaching after uh, the, the directions Jesus gave. He said, go out in pairs and twos. And that's how he sent them out. Uh, uh, when Jesus sent the, the apostles and, and disciples out to go preach all around, all around the countryside, uh, he sent them in pairs, and then they came back, and he got a report from them, and he asked them, what are the people saying about me? And well, it, but the idea of him sending it out, out in twos, there's a lot of significance in that. Uh, one, I think, is, is so that um, there's always a witness. If, if, you're out, if you're out completely by yourself, people can, can uh, say you did something, and it's only your word against theirs. But if, if you have a, someone with you, then you've got a witness to everything you've done. And, of course, the other thing is a co-worker. Uh, so I always want to do my street preaching and have someone with me. And if I was doing the preaching, then they would pass out tracts and have one-on-one -on -one dialogue with people who had questions. And if they were preaching, I, I would pass out tracts and, and answer the questions. So um, uh, it seems that's the way it was done. And then they would go back to the group as a whole, the, the, the whole church. Uh, and, and uh, well, I shouldn't say the whole church. I don't think that from so far, it seems like we've got uh, maybe up, up to 10,000 people in the church in a matter of days. Uh, there were 3,000 converted, and then I think four or 5,000 converted, and then it also says that every day more were added. So they probably went back to just the, this, the group of apostles or their, their, their main, uh, 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 let's say, uh, fellowship. Uh, I think the the apostles probably at this point stuck still stuck together pretty in a, as a group, um, and so uh, I don't remember if there's anything else in there that uh, okay. I guess that's all I have to say about that. Uh, except that it says they they lift up their God uh, voice to God with one accord and. So they were all praising God and praying together. Uh, I'll go to verse 25 next, but let me get your thoughts on those two verses. Yeah, uh, you know, there, there must have been uh, a large gathering. You know, we know, of, like you said, somewhere in the neighborhood of at least 10,000 people uh, that were converted in a very short period of time. And uh, earlier in the book, it talks about how they uh, enjoyed congregating together and, and even living communally to one degree or another at this point. Uh, so uh, I guess that's like a mega church uh, on the street, moving from one place to another. Uh, they they must have been uh, absolutely a great threat to uh, Orthodox Israel, and so. Uh, yeah, and, and the two by two, I don't have any experience with street preaching at all, but it uh, seems, seems like a smart way to go. Back to you, Luke. Um, also, you know, I, I, uh, I hope I don't ever give anybody the impression that I would uh, be someone you could classify as uh, 
anti-Paul, because that's the way some people have reacted to me, because what I've done is I've taken a position that um, the, the same gospel message was preached by Jesus, John, Peter, and Paul. Uh, it's the same message. And, and Paul was not the, ex the only one to preach this true message uh, uh, for us today, and that he wasn't even the first. Um, so because I've taken that position, some people react, well, you're against Paul. I'm not against Paul. I defend Paul against those who, who uh, even in the scriptures, we find at that time there's people who are arguing that he's not really an apostle. And then, of course, that's lasted 2,000 years. There's people today on YouTube we encounter that argue Paul's not really an apostle. Uh, but so what, but seems to me what Paul did, uh, I mean, I, there's a couple of examples of him preaching, but mostly it seems like what Paul was doing was writing and clarifying doctrine. Uh, and, and uh, you know, he, he made personal appearances at churches. It wasn't, it was just nothing but writing. But I, I can't recall any examples of Paul preaching and having thousands of people converted like, like Peter. Uh, maybe maybe I'm just failing to remember it, but do you, are you aware of anything like that with, with Paul? Uh, just the opposite. Uh, uh, Paul was a church planter, and I think there's plenty of evidence in the Bible that shows he planted churches and uh, left the, the, the preaching to, to others, uh, and he gave doctrinal uh, uh, edicts and, and uh, whatnot. Uh, the only time I can recall him street preaching was when he was uh, beaten quite severely by Romans and uh, and other countrymen. Uh, so no large crowds, no large conversions, nothing that I remember, anything like what Peter is accomplishing here. Uh, we remember him up at Mars Hill. I guess that could be considered street preaching, but uh, no con no real conversions that, that's spoken of, uh, rather uh, the arguing of uh, doctrine says he is all things to all people so he can win a few. Uh, so I think Peter is, uh, and John and the other apostles are, uh, are there for the explosion of the uh, church, the birth of the church. And Paul, like you said, was more of a, a doctrinal uh, teacher and a church planter. So his street preaching was not uh, not very effective, or at least, well, I won't say that. It's, it's still effective to this day. But he didn't. It's not listed that he had converts like this. Back to you. Um, yeah, I, I even recall that there is a verse in Paul's uh, letters uh, where he says that uh, he's more impressive in writing than he is in person. Uh, in other words, he, he's not going to come and give a, a beautiful sermon uh, that's that impressive. People may even be disappointed in him when they meet him personally, but it's his writing that, that uh, seems to be more effective. So he, uh, I'd say he would be the scholar the, uh, uh, and also the church planner, the, the missionary that goes off starting churches. Um, and it seems that when he did preach, most of the time, it failed in terms of creating converts. What it did was create, you know, large numbers of people who wanted to kill it. <laughs> so that seemed to be the result of Paul's preaching, whereas Peter's preaching it was all thousands of people coming to the Lord. Uh, all right, I'll read a little further here. Um, uh, verse twenty-four. No, I'm sorry, verse 25. Uh, who by the mouth of thy servant David hast said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against the, thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Uh, so 
again, this is this is talking about the you know again more about the fact that the world as a whole was re had rejected Jesus, and uh, um, I'm going to read that portion in the Amplified see if it's helpful too here. Uh, verse twenty five. This is quoting scripture what he, in verse twenty four and twenty five. And, and when they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, quote, O sovereign Lord, having complete power and authority, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, so this is the point where they're quoting David, why did the nations, there were Gentiles, become arrogant and rage and the peoples devised futile things against the Lord. Uh, the kings of the earth took their stand to attack, and the rulers were assembled together against the Lord and against his anointed, the, the Christ, the Messiah. Yeah. Uh, for, in, for in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and, and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined before the creation of the world to occur. And so without knowing it, they served your own purpose. That's through verse 28. So what um, they're quoting David, and then he goes on to say, point out that this is, this is how David's prophecy was fulfilled. And they cite Herod, Pontius Pilate, and, and the, the reaction as a whole to Jesus. Okay, brother. Yeah, I mean, you got to remember that Peter is still uh, preaching to uh, the, the Jews. And uh, he's going back to the Old Testament to show them what was missed, uh, that they went ahead and fulfilled the prophecies that they're all aware of now. I don't think those prophecies were ever taught as uh, uh, going to be coming true in their lifetimes, but the prophecies nevertheless are there. So as a matter of fact, they may even be more preaching to the scribes, Pharisees, and priests uh, than the people, because the scribes, Pharisees, and priests are the ones who are going to be very literate and, uh, and very aware of the Psalms and the prophecies. So uh, uh, they're just continuing to make their case. And uh, it's interesting, you know, the Lord came first to the Jews and then through the Jews to the Gentiles. And that's exactly uh, how he was rejected also. Back to you, Luke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if, if I remember correctly, I mean, I have to go look at the exact context, uh, but I, I think I'm right in saying that the verse that says the first shall be last and the last shall be first is is, is prophetic about about this uh, this uh, thing too that uh, the the first to be offered the salvation are the, were the last to to re, to receive it. Uh, in other words, there's going to come a time in the future where a lot of Jews will come to believe in Jesus. But for the most part, the Jews, except for, we have thousands here in this example, but when we look at the number of Jews that were converted in the, in the first century, of, uh, uh, let's say that there's, there's 10,000 so far, and let's say that another 10 or 20,000 are added to the church over time, maybe 100,000. But um, I, I just don't think that that's a tiny little fraction of the, the Jewish believers. Uh, they're a tiny fraction compared to the, the history of Christianity throughout the world, which has been probably 99 or, or more percent uh, Gentiles and believe him. And that's why the scripture says that uh, he'll be rejected by his own people, but become the light to the Gentiles. Uh, all right. Any, anything else before I read further? Yeah, I, 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 if memory serves me, uh, when Israel was a, a state, uh, Israel was a nation uh, from from their heyday during the time of Moses uh, through this time. I, if memory serves me, the the numbers that, that were given 
uh, uh, we're between three and six million fluctuating, depending on where in history we're, we're at. So uh, that kind of gives us some kind of idea uh, of the number of uh, people of Israel there were, and if 100,000 uh, converted to Christ, and let's just take a low estimate of 3 million or 4 million Jews alive at the time, uh, that's a very, very small uh, number. Back to you, Luke. All right. Back to the KJV verse uh, uh, tw 29. Uh, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Hmm. I did interesting. Uh, this is twice now. Verse 27 also refers to the holy child, Jesus. I, I, I'm curious why they would be reflecting back to Jesus as a child. Uh, maybe it's just thinking, saying child in the sense that he's the son of God, not a little child. But uh, uh, but he just, it says, and now, Lord, behold, they're threatening. So he, they're asking, they're saying, they're, they're threatening us, but they're praying, grant thy servants that with boldness they may speak thy word. I mean, could you imagine it? I mean, at this point, uh, I don't think we... We don't have any martyrs, uh, uh, so I think the first record of a martyr, and it's actually, uh, I forget the exact time frame between um, Jesus's uh, ascension and Stephen's death. I think it's quite some time. I, I don't think it's a matter of days, weeks, months. I think it's years. Uh, I think it's a couple of years might be three and a half years, according to some people, the way they understand Daniel's uh, 70th week. But they, uh, there's a lot of threatenings. There's beatings, and, you know, and, uh, but so far, nobody is uh, killed by the, the authorities. Uh, but then they know that they killed the Lord and that they are threatening that, same thing for them. So they knew that it was going to take a lot of, of courage. And they they probably felt that they couldn't have that kind of courage from their own strength. They're praying God to give them the boldness. Brother, what do you say? Well, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by the reference to uh, the child. Uh, that's interesting to me. And I have no idea why that's there. Um, because son of God would seem more appropriate, uh, but referencing to him as a child, I'm sure there's something very, very important there, but I have no idea what it is. But as far as the rest of it goes, yeah, they just saw the Lord crucified in the most grotesque and horrifying uh, way imaginable. And, uh, and, and here they are uh, following in his footsteps uh, in such a short amount of time later and so, uh, you know, who wouldn't be terrified? You know, it's, it, they're the primary targets, whoever's out, you know, a disciple of Christ. But uh, you got to remember, there's now at least 10,000 of them that are all uh, risking their lives joining this cult as the, as the uh, leaders of Israel would see it and uh, threatening the, the very existence of their political structure and religious structure. So, yeah, I'd be terrified. I mean, I don't think it's any worse than it would be to be a Christian in Iraq, Iran, or uh, uh, some parts of the Middle East, though. And I think that that sort of courage uh, must still be uh, shown today by people that we're, we'll never hear of. So, yeah, if it was me, I'd be petrified seeing what they did to Christ. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, the... Uh, um, the 
I, I, again, I can't really say with certainty the timeline between um, Pentecost say, and Stephen's death. I mean, if I look into that, I think I did look in it once before, and so I was actually very surprised um, because when you read the scriptures, you, you're not getting this impression um, that that uh, a qu quite a bit of time has passed before someone actually dies uh, as a martyr. Uh, but I believe it is uh, not; it's years, not you know weeks or months. Uh, but during that time, that early time, you have. Uh, uh, everybody, these people are boldly preaching. The church is growing quickly, but at this point, um, most people, the the Sanhedrin and th th that f faction, they would say that it's uh, da damnable or heretics, blasphemers, you know. Um, but the the other people who became believers, they really just considered it. It was a and the, and the Roman authorities, they didn't draw a great distinction between these two groups. It was more of a, a, another sect of Judaism. And I remember uh, I, I used to, for a short time, I went to a Messianic Jewish congregation here in Las Vegas, and I met the Messianic Jewish believers. And uh, I, I think they they made make a real big mistake by holding on to a lot of the, the Judaism. Uh, that's today because Paul in, in Galatians and Hebrews the whole point is you got to get rid of all your Judaism but these Messianic Jewish believers today uh, they believe pretty much as we do except they still are holding on to their religious practices and they all unfortunately many of them believe that that factors into a formula for salvation but uh, these these Messianic Jewish people I met they refer to themselves as what they call completed Jews uh, because you know they're Jewish and now their Judaism faith is completed because they, they believe that Jesus is the promised one. Um, uh, I'm going to go on. Anything else, brother? Uh, no, nothing. Uh, there's a lot to be said in what you just said, but I don't want to get too far off track. So go ahead. Luke. Okay. All right. Verse 32, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that uh, aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Uh, this is what we were talking about in an earlier study about this was like the beginning, the first, uh, first thing in, in history that I'm aware of. Uh, any place in the world where you had a form of communism where everything was there was no individual ownership of anything they sold everything pitched their money together and whoever had a need uh, was provided for um, and, and that with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord and great grace upon them all so um uh, I'm not really, oh, I want to read this whole portion in the Amplified because uh, uh, there was something earlier I wanted to see how they phrased it. I'll start with verse uh, third and 29. And now, Lord, uh, now, Lord, observe their threats, take them into account, and grant that your bond servants may declare your message of salvation with great confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs of, and wonders, attesting miracles. Take place through the name and the authority and power of your holy servant and son, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were meeting together was shaken, a sign of God's presence, Verse 31, I didn't catch that in the in the uh, KJV. Let me see. Oh, yeah. It says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. How did I miss that the first time I read it? Um, and when they prayed, the place, uh, back to the Amplified, and when they prayed, the place where they were meeting together was shaken, a sign of God's presence, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness and courage. Uh, now, verse 32, now the company of believers was of one heart and soul, 
and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was exclusively his own, but everything was common property and for the use of all. And with great ability and power, the apostles were continuously testifying to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace, God's remarkable loving kindness and favor and goodwill rested richly upon them all. That's the end was verse 33. All right, brother, that was the same portion in the Amplified. I thought that was kind of helpful. What do you say? Oh, yeah, very helpful, very illuminating. Uh, wow, you know, I, I keep thinking, you know, there's so many uh, uh, churches, uh, the Pentecostal variety, that uh, that that take the, these portions of Scripture and try to, try to make it happen today. Uh, but I think that was a unique time in history. Uh, can you imagine being there? That is amazing. I just I was over on the, the other on a Yahoo page trying to research how many Jews were in Jerusalem for the for the Passover festival, and uh, I, I see here that uh, there was about forty thousand people that were Jewish that lived in Jerusalem at the time of Christ, and for the festivals such as Pentecost, it swelled to a quarter million, and so we're looking at about five percent or more of the population that had become Christians in this short amount of time, maybe as much as 10%. So uh, you had, they had 90% of the population uh, that were not. And so their lives were definitely in danger uh, because of the powerfulness and the, the numbers of this cult that, that they saw as a cult. Uh, regarding the, the acts of the Holy Spirit establishing the church. Uh, can you imagine being there, you know, and having an, an earthquake-like experience and, and the, the oneness of spirit? And like you were saying, a true communist or a pure communism mindset. Uh, but it wasn't really a political communism because it was all done uh, by free will. There was no mandate. It was just all, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And uh, as a matter of fact, you mentioned Ananias and Sapphira yesterday who claimed they gave everything, but actually only gave half of what they had, but they wanted people to think they'd given it all. This was all free will. And uh, I cannot imagine that mindset. I guess maybe in China, some parts of China, some parts of uh, persecuted Christendom today, that, that the spirit may be that powerful and, and that unifying, but uh, short of the side of heaven, uh, I don't expect to experience it. Back to you, Luke. Hmm. <laughs> you asked me a very, very difficult question. Uh, you said, could you imagine being back there at that, that time, witnessing all that? And, you know, I've often thought about what if I had lived at that time? And on one hand, you have the, the, the wonder of being a witness to all these events, all these miraculous things. But on the other hand, you know that all of these people were going to suffer. Uh, you know, the, 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 very few of these people who believed in Jesus in the, the, at that time would go on to old age and, you know, uh, uh, suffer, a, uh, just uh, have a uh, natural death uh, because the tide will, does turn against them all. And, and they, uh, and, and of course, they, even Peter was told by Jesus, his, his fate that was awaiting him. And so if you're a Christian at that time, you know, you, you get to uh, see such marvels, but at the same time, um, you can't escape the, the, the horrible suffering that they went through. So in that way, you know, I certainly would fear, uh, you know, the, the, the suffering part of it. My wife often has said to me several times, uh, I don't know why she gets the impression, you know, I've, I spent a lot of years actually as a, you know, fighter. I've had martial arts schools for numerous times in my life. I've operated them and done a lot of training and, and combat. 
and I, I've never thought of myself or nobody who knows me thinks of myself as being like timid or cowardly. But my wife thinks I would be a coward when it comes to person suffering from like the martyrs did, that, that, that I would recant, you know, uh, yeah, I would uh, rather than than holding to my faith, I would recant under under, uh, you know, torture. I don't know. I don't know why she says that. It's, it really hurts me that, that she thinks that of me. But I, I do know that uh, I would dread uh, knowing that you know that's that's your uh, that's your future if you're a believer at that time in history, brother. I think we, as Christians, we've all fantasized or or put ourselves in a mindset: what would I be like if I was back there when Christ walked the earth? What would it be like to be uh, with Him? And and of course. Uh, the superhero self, the imagined self, uh, says, well, I'd gladly give my life to, to say a few words of comfort to Christ while he was on the cross, uh, just like the uh, imagined self who uh, stands up against 10 uh, people wanting to beat him up, and in your mind you see yourself just, I can I can get him, you know, I in your mind you say, I'll do this and I'll do that. But you got to remember the, the disciples, except for John, all abandoned Christ, and I suspect out of fear. It wasn't out of lack of love, it was out of fear that those that loved him greatest were gone. They weren't taking the chance. You know, Peter denied Christ three times for a reason, and uh, each one of them uh, could see themselves, well, they might just throw up another cross for me, you know, and uh, the only one with the, the intestinal fortitude to be there was his mother, uh, and John, and I'm not sure if Mary Magdalene was there or not, but uh, yeah, if we're really there, Luke, uh, I think it's a different story. And if you want to see superheroes uh, today, that you don't have to fantasize about what they would do. Look to the guys that are getting their heads cut, cut off lately over there in the Middle East without denying Christ. Uh, look, look to North Korea and the uh, people who... Uh, go to prison labor camps of, of horrible torture uh, for God knows how long uh, for simply claiming Christ, not rejecting Christ. Those are the superheroes alive today. Uh, as for me, uh, you know, in my mind, I'd be there and I'd be willing to give my life to give the Lord a few words of comfort on the cross. In reality, I'm sure that, you know, I'd probably be with the other disciples that were hiding uh, so that they didn't meet the same fate. Back to you, Luke. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's pros and cons to that uh, question, but uh, uh, to be able to be a witness would be marvelous, uh, but we that's not possible. But what we have is the most comfortable form of Christianity. Uh, you know, here we can talk about Jesus and no one's arresting us and, you know, uh, put us in, in, in jail or, or, or sentence us to prison and, and, and uh, or giving us, you know, torturing us or capital punishment against it. Uh, but much of the world but throughout church history, that's been the case. And even much of the world today, that is still the case. And yet here we are in 2016 in America with a, you know, no worry about shelter and food and comfort in every way. We can practice our Christianity without any fear at all. And I'm happy that I'm, I'm not under that kind of a threat and fear, but, um, uh, I guess that's a, a, a point that since we have it so good, it, uh, it, it's so easy for us, it would be a real shame for us not to be vocal, not to, not to spread, the, <laughs> spread the gospel when we know we, we can do it without even any risk of, uh, of harm. I'll go on, but you're any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I got I to gotta confess, I'm a big pussy, Luke. Uh, you know, we have a, a neighborhood internet group here, uh, the next door, you know, neighborhood group where you, through the cable company, you 
you know, uh, join a neighborhood group and all your neighbors are there and, you know, they report crime and they, you know, just, it's just a gathering place for the neighborhood. And, you know, I said something akin to proclaiming my faith because of a certain conversation that was going on in a forum. And, you know, everyone's, there were like a, three quarters of the people that were there were making notes that, you know, oh, he's one of those weirdos. And that's all it took to shut me up, Luke. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to deal with this, man. Everyone's going to think I'm a weirdo. And, you know, I, I, I'm i not denying Christ, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to put myself on the weirdo chopping block either. And, you know, doing what you do, going out street preaching. Uh, oh, man. <clears throat> I can't imagine. Uh, I don't have what it takes. I, I'm spineless. Uh, I guess it's because I'm too comfortable. You know, these Christians we're talking about right now in the book of Acts, uh, yeah, they'll have a, a church in Jerusalem eventually, but uh, it won't be very long before the Caesar decides to uh, use them for lion food for the entertainment of uh, Romans. And so, uh, yeah, I, you know, I guess comfort uh, makes you soft, and uh, I'd like to think that uh, I, I'm tougher than I am, but I, I don't know that many Americans uh, could do what you do, street preach. Uh, I guess we'll never know how tough we are until God puts us in that position, and I just pray that I make it to heaven without ever having to test my mettle, I guess. Back to you, Luke. Hmm. Well, I guess I'll tell you just a couple of brief experiences I had in the street preaching that relate to this. Uh, I never really had a great fear of bodily harm when I was street preaching because I mentioned earlier I'm very trained, very able to defend myself. So that wasn't my, my concern. Um, but on the other hand, I didn't want to use it. I wanted to uh, be a pacifist. I wanted to... And, and, and I've had objects thrown at me. Fortunately, they missed. <laughs> I've been spit upon. They didn't miss. Um, I've been, you know, threatened and screamed at and people getting in my face screaming as I'm, I'm preaching. I've had people challenge me, threaten they're going to beat me up in front of 100 people. And as I act that time, I'm preaching in a wheelchair because uh, my health was I couldn't I couldn't stand for more than like 30 seconds and my legs would go give out on they were numb and but is it even while this person was there and, and they're and it's very threatening in my mind I, instead of thinking um, I'm trying to stay focused on preaching but I had in the back of my mind a a, a a strike I was ready to strike them and I was all but I was like conflicted because I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to ruin the ministry and I remember one day three three or four Mormon guys that were, were taunting me when I was preaching. And and one of them got behind me and was, uh, um, what were they, how do you call it? Uh, he was kind of simulating sexually assaulting me from behind it. And I got, I was, I finally lo lost it with him and I, and I put my fist right in his face and, 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 and threatened him. I said, just say one more word. You know, I, I really lost it at that point where I, I really, I, I'm just glad that they backed down. Because I, I didn't, because it would have been such an embarrassment to the ministry, to, uh, and I, I've been with other preachers that have been struck, and they they've never responded back, so, um, I don't know if I could could do that though. I, I don't know if my my uh, I don't I don't want to think it'd be pride, but it's just my my natural reaction might be such I I, I couldn't re restrain myself. All right, go on, else you. Want to say anything more about all this? I don't have anything else to say, Luke. Okay. Uh, is it common? Verse 34. Uh, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Um, but the, the important thing to understand about this, you, you mentioned, we, we, we talked about this once before, that uh, 
Uh, this was not um, a, a dictum that was given down by the apostles, uh, saying everybody sell all your property. We're going to pool the money and operate in this uh, as a community. Uh, no one, no one's told to do that. It just seemed like the unction of the Holy Spirit. For everybody decided to do it, uh, and uh, um, of course, this doesn't last though. And I say, I think I, we talked about this once before, where I said that this is a like a first um, thing that I see in any any writings. And maybe, I've, of course, I haven't read all history, but I don't know of anything else that talks about a, a communistic type of an experiment like this uh, that goes back to this so far back in history. But it, it failed to endure because the church has not continued to operate like that. So I'm not sure if it lasted weeks or months or a couple of years, but uh, eventually people stopped selling everything, giving it, and, and then everybody sharing. And I think it's because of the flesh, the, 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 our, our human nature uh, interfered. And the only way that true communism type of thinking where you're it's all about the the benefit of others rather than your individual putting yourself first um, the only way that will ever work will be off in eternity when we have we're perfected um, all right give you uh, any thoughts before we only got a couple of verses left after that but what are your thoughts on all that well you remember uh, i think we mentioned it yesterday at, at some point very soon <clears throat> there's going to start being complaining, uh, you know, hey, this guy is not working. He's just taking advantage of the, of the uh, generosity of uh, people who have given. And uh, it was Peter, I think, that said, well, if a man won't work, then don't let him eat. And so corruption uh, crept in. And uh, I don't think we can have uh, the kind of communal living that, that uh, started there until, until uh, the Lord comes back, I'm sure. So, yeah, but our flesh uh, corrupts everything, doesn't it? Okay. All right, um, verse 30, uh, 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, uh, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Uh, I don't know if uh, the, it connects the dots at any point as we go along to so that we know that this is the Barnabas that we, we read about uh, being Paul's companion. Uh, I'm guessing it probably is that same Barnabas but it's interesting, I didn't note before that his name was Joseph. Let me see how it says it in the Amplified. It says, Joseph. Now Joseph, a Levite. So Barnabas's name is Joseph, and he's a Levite, which is the, the uh, of the 12 sons of um, Jacob or Israel, of his 12 sons, one was Levi, and his descendants would all be the priests and they were not allowed to own any land and, and, and um, have any inheritance. So everybody paid their 10% and it went to support the Levites um, because they were full-time priests handling the, all of the things to dealing with the temple and the sacrifices. And so, but I had no idea that Barnabas was Joseph and he was a Levite. Uh, but he, he sold his land, he brought the money, and he gave it to the apostles. All right, brother? Well, it, it speaks to how long the, the church uh, was like this, though, because he was of Cyprus. That's uh, no, no real small distance from Jerusalem. And uh, he would have had to have gone home to Cyprus, sold his land, and then brought the money back. So I'm thinking, you know, that's probably at least months that uh, the church was still in this euphoric uh, communal living. Uh, I'm not sure how long it lasted, but uh, for some time, I guess. And, and uh, 
it's kind of funny that if this is the same guy that he ends up with Paul many years later. So yeah, this, these are things I didn't see either. Well, sometimes a chapter is a good place to end, but, but uh, if I know we want to quit by uh, four, so we get, uh, make this 90 minutes, but um, we could go a little further if you're up to it uh, and talk about uh, Ananias and Sapphira, or do you want to continue on? Yeah, let's go ahead, Luke. Okay. All right, so chapter five now, verse one. But a certain man named Ananias, uh, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a, a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Uh, while it remained, was it not thine? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Well, uh, first of all, it's very, very clear here that uh, there was no compulsion for Ananias. Peter's making that very clear. It was yours. You didn't have to sell it. And even after you sold it, you didn't have to give the money. And, he, and even when he gave you the money, and you could have given whatever part you wanted. But the problem is you lied. But he, said, he says you lied to the Holy Ghost in verse 3. And he, in verse 5, you lied. Uh, no, verse into verse 4, you lied to God. Now, this is a, a proof text when we want to prove that the Holy Spirit is, is God. Uh, but one of the places you go here is it says that he lied to the Holy Ghost. He, that means he lied to God. Um, so uh, it's, it, it wasn't the issue of um, him um, holding back any money. It was the issue was that he, he lied about it. And, he, and Peter saying, it's, if he lied to men, maybe it wouldn't be a big deal, but you're lying to the Holy Spirit. Okay, brother, what do you say? Well, this is this is exactly why I wanted to continue on, uh, because actually, for me, this is probably the most fascinating part of, uh, of our study so far. Keep in mind, guys, whoever's watching this, we're in the age of grace, and uh, our sins are not supposed to be held against us, right? And... Uh, you know, how many of us do a lot more than lie? Now, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they weren't trying to trick the Holy Spirit. You know, they weren't trying to trick God. Uh, surely they knew that God knew. So their deceit was towards the people of God. And uh, how does, I mean, everything I have here is questions, not answers. So don't, don't think I'm teaching. I'm asking. Uh, we're in the age of grace. Now, I remember back in the Old Testament when they were transporting the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, there was uh, one of the ends of the Ark fell off the poles that, that it was being transported on. And the, I forget the name of the soldier or the name of the Israeli, but some young man didn't want to see that Ark touch the ground. Oh, no, the Ark can't hit the ground. So he went and grabbed the corner of the ark to keep it from touching the ground, and God struck him dead because the law was that you don't touch the ark of the covenant. <clears throat> so this young man had good intentions and yet was struck down by God. I find that just fascinating. And uh, here we are in the age of grace. We're not under the law. Our sins are not being held against us. Yet these guys lied to the congregation. It says they lied to God. Again, questions, not answers. And God struck them dead, and fear spread throughout the, the, the church. Um, man, it makes you really think twice about exaggerating on uh, anything, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know. But I, I'd love to hear what you think on this, Luke. 
Well, let me read a little further so we get to see what happens because you, you've actually jumped a little bit ahead of the verses. Then I'll give you my thoughts on all of it. Um, it uh, and verse 5, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. Uh, and the young man arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. Uh, well, I have a lot of interesting, as you say, you know, questions too about this. I have more questions than answers. Just, <laughs> this has also been, for me, the, the same kind of a thing where this is an amazing portion of scriptures trying to understand it. Uh, but the, the fact that uh, he died uh, is not any surprise because he's going to die someday. The, 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 the question is not that he's dying. Everybody's going to die. But the question is, his life was shortened. So the fact that uh, he died, um, I mean, it, to me, it doesn't make God like the bad guy that he took someone's life. And even the guy that grabbed the thing, you know, uh, and the, you cited, uh, um, he's going to die anyway. It's just that he died sooner. Uh, so um, the life was shortened. Now, what's the implication of, of your life being shortened? Um, I, I don't know. I, I like us even a sin unto death. You know, the, 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 there's a verse that talks about a sin unto death. If you do a sin that it results in your death, uh, some people think the sin unto death is that God strikes him dead, like, like in this case. That maybe this was a sin unto death. Uh, this is the sin unto death because this is kind of like when Jesus said, blasphemy the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, this is, according to Peter here, this is against the Holy Spirit. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. So maybe in that case, it's uh, uh, God is going to strike him dead or sometimes a sin unto death because could be just you've abused your health with bad living for so long that the, the, the sin of not taking care of your body resulted in an earlier death. You lost 20 years of life because of it. So uh, that is not God striking you down. It's just, a, it's like one of the brothers uh, that joined us recently from, Bill introduced to us from, uh, I think, Sweden. His name is Mikhail. In a, in a study a month ago, he, he said his mother says, sin punishes itself. I've loved that saying, and I've been waiting to use it again. But the idea is, is if a person does sinful things, let's say, related to their body, if, if, if it's sinful, and I think most people would say it's sinful to abuse our bodies in terms of uh, really bad health habits, not taking care of ourselves. Well, if that's, if that's sinful, well, God doesn't have to kill you because, because you didn't take care of your health. Uh, the, the sin itself punishes you and, and takes your life sooner. So, um, it, whether God is striking them dead like he did with Ananias and Sapphira, or whether a sin results in a shorter life, the, what, what is the consequence of a shorter life? Is this a bad thing? Um, if, for those of us who believe that we're promised eternal life and that uh, the, in eternity everything is much better than it is now, uh, like, Coming, it's not just twice as good, it's a zillion times better than now. So if that's the case, uh, to, to, to live as Christ, but to die as gain, it would be better to die. So if it's better to die, why is it such a, a, tra a tragic thing or, or a, a, an adverse thing for, for uh, Ananias to be dead? Isn't it better? Isn't to die as gain? So these are the kinds of questions I've had about this portion of Scripture. Brother, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, you did a good job there in, in supplying the context, and, and the context has to be considered. And so you, you, you've done that brilliantly. But quite honestly, it hasn't touched my question. Because uh, now I've got brothers from every stripe on YouTube. I've got the predestination guys. I've got the... Uh, uh, 
legalist guys. I've got the now some of the guys that I'm and gals that I'm uh, friends with, they'll tell you uh, the Romans through Th uh, Philemon crowd, especially that God holds no sins against us from the time Christ uh, resurrected from the eight we entered the age of grace, and uh, you can you know. Uh, like you said, have consequences in the body and in the flesh, but God's not laying anything to our account. Uh, so uh, we'll have re natural uh, fallback from sin. In other words, if we want to be sexually promiscuous, we're probably going to get a disease, an STD. If we uh, drive our car recklessly, we're probably going to get killed. That's not the case here, Luke. This is someone who sinned against God by telling a lie, now, I don't know how, it, how he interprets he lied to the Holy Spirit, because God is omniscient. You can't lie to God. Uh, and I don't think they were trying to lie to God. I think they were trying to show themselves to be more magnanimous than they were. So in their mind, I don't think they said, let's fool God. I think they said, let's fool the church. Let's, let's make, you know, let's be prideful and, and show that we are uh, so generous. So... And also during communion, it says many of you are asleep. Well, that is relating to being absent from the body, present with the Lord, I think, uh, because they took communion unworthily. Well, these are acts of God holding sin to our account in this life. And yet we, we free gracers, especially us uh, uh, Romans through uh, Philemon crowd, uh, we don't see that. We, we, we teach and preach that our sins are not held against us uh, from God. But this belies that fact rather blatantly, and I don't think anyone's ever addressed it that I know of. Uh, so a little more confusion. Back to you, Luke. All right. Um, you've, 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 the first time I basically forgot your question, otherwise I would have answered it then. But now that you've... you've brought it up a second time, uh, I specifically address it. Um, um, that he's not going to hold our sins against us, and that's true. And he's not holding your sins against Ananias and Sapphira in, the, in this case regarding salvation. If, if they were saved, they're still saved. They're in heaven. Now, I don't know if they were saved or not. People argue about this particular example, if they were truly saved or not. But if someone uh, is saved, their sins are not held against them, affecting their salvation. That's so that that is is a fact. And that and to, that's the that's specifically the way of, of applying it to your question. God's not holding our sins against us regarding our salvation. So do you understand that? Yeah, yeah, you know, that, that's a good clarification. Thank you, Luke. That is a good clarification, by the way. Uh, but I, I would, you know, I've been hanging around with a lot of people who uh, think that uh, uh, sin is of no consequence except in our natural, uh, except the natural result of it. You know what I mean? God's not punishing us for sin. But I think this is a, a clear indicator that there, there can be sin in our lives that God does punish us for and and uh, i agree with you to die is gain but <clears throat> let's face it the entire church was terrified uh so uh and and god does place a premium on a long life so there, it, it is punishment and uh so uh you know our sin is not without spiritual as well as physical consequence and uh that's an important thing to keep in mind to all my friends out there who may tune into this eventually and and uh, they're the ones who say, hey, God's not going to ever punish us for sin. It's all forgiven. And uh, they don't say regarding salvation. They just uh, they say we're, we're scot-free except for natural consequences. I think this is a real good proof text. That's not necessarily the case. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, well, you know, you had questions about all this, uh, this portion of Scripture. And, and I, I said, I, I've always had a lot of questions about it, too. But the question I've always had is um, if, if striking them dead is supposed to be some kind of a punishment, how is it a punishment 
if they get to be with the Lord even sooner. It's not, I can't see it's a punishment. The only answer I've gotten from anybody is, see, they didn't have, they could have had maybe 10 or 20 more years to, to, to work and earn rewards for the Bema seat. But now they didn't, they've lost that opportunity to earn rewards. That's the only answer I've gotten. But, but if we, if, if, apart from that, how is it a punishment to die and knowing that you're going to be with the Lord in, in, immediately? Right. I, I get that, Luke. But uh, it, it does say, you know, honor your mother and father that you may have a long life. Uh, that in, in A long life on this earth is seen as a good thing uh, by people and by God, of course. It goes against our nature uh, to, uh, I guess, want to be present with the Lord before our time <laughs> so uh and and uh and i guess i think it is a punishment uh from god uh i don't think god says well i'm gonna you've sinned against me now i'm gonna do you a favor uh or you know the the the, the part that you fear is not oh gee i'm not going to be able to earn more more rewards in heaven i don't think that, that is the last thing on the church's mind uh, when terror spread amongst them, they were like, oh, no, I don't want to get struck down. And uh, uh, the example of communion further on uh, would be a, a good proof text for that. Thanks, you, Luke. Well, to me, all, all your questions and my questions and our all our answers is interesting, but unsatisfying in terms of feeling like, well, okay, now we really get it. We really worked it out. We, we, I just, I, I've all, I've struggled with this portion of scripture for a long time, and and I'm still feeling, you know, I don't really get it. But uh, okay, I, I stop here. Next time uh, we'll, we'll 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 get into her, his wife Sapphira, and that that way the two will be connected together. But let me ask you to summarize the study for today, and then I'll give a, a gospel uh, message. Well, to summarize the study, it's been enjoyable uh, studying the Word of God with you, Luke, as always. It, it, the funny thing, you know, of all these questions and all these deep thoughts and all of the things we've considered, what I'm going to look at after we're off air and, and I have some time later tonight, uh, I'm going right back and I'm going to do a study on why they called Christ the child twice. Where they don't, I don't know that it does that anywhere else in the Bible. And I'm surprised that it's here. You know, I understand when he was born, of course, you know, a child is, uh, a, a child is given. When a child is born, a son is given. But uh, referring back to him, calling him a child, those two verses are what's really illuminated to me uh, great interest. And, and the rest of it was just good study. So... Uh, that's kind of a weird summary, but that's that's what my where my mind is. Luke, back to you. Yeah. All right. Um, rather than talking any further about it, uh, I'll just go right into the gospel message. And uh, um, there, let me just quote a verse to base everything on. There. This is Romans ten three. This is the Amplified translation, I believe, of Romans ten three. It says. For they don't understand that Christ has died to make them right with God. Instead, they're trying to make themselves good enough to gain God's favor by keeping the laws and customs, but that is not God's way of salvation. Romans 10.3. Um, to me, that's very, very significant because that explains the, the problem in the world. The problem in the world today is not that we're all sinners and deserve to go to hell because Jesus resolved that by dying for all of our sins. The problem is that people don't recognize that as the solution. Instead, they think the solution to their sin and the, 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 uh, the, their, uh, they want to go to heaven, they want to be with God, and yet they fear sin is preventing it. So what they need to do is clean up their life get sin out of their life, make themselves presentable, and so they can go before God and say, hey, am I righteous enough? So that verse is saying, this This is the way that the world perceives it, but it's not God's way. Uh, God's way is recognizing that we get righteousness from Jesus Christ, not from our own efforts. We put our faith in him, and his righteousness is credited to us. So 
to me, this is the the problem in the world uh, throughout all of history and 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 even almost all churches around the world today. People are being taught that if you want to go to heaven, it's determined by personal merit. That um, uh, heaven is a reward for a life well lived, a reward for good behavior. But the Bible says that's not the case at all. And in fact, Jesus says getting into heaven that way is impossible. He says there is one way, and that's through him. So that's the main thing people need to understand is that give up on the idea that you can uh, uh, join religions, become a religious person, strictly follow a set of religious rules, and then go before God and plead your case and say, see, I'm good enough. Reject that as a philosophy, as a belief system entirely. Instead, just plead, Jesus is my savior. My faith is in him. If I was before God right now and he said, why should I let you into heaven? It says, not because of anything I've done, but because of what Jesus did for me. What did he do for you? He died for all my sins. He cut down on that cross and paid for my sins. And, I, and he promised that I get to go to heaven if I put my faith in him. This is the correct theology for salvation that we find in the Bible. But you're not getting that kind of theology in most of the churches around the world today. So uh, just asking you, put your faith in Jesus. No, put your faith in yourself, in your own ability. Uh, Jesus is eternal God Almighty. The Bible says he came down from heaven and became a man named Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh. The, the Bible says that he died on the cross to pay for our sins. The Bible says he was buried, but on the third day he raised, was raised from the dead bodily. And Jesus predicted beforehand that they're going to kill me, but I'll raid myself back to life as a proof that I am God and Savior. So believe that. Believe that you're going to go to heaven solely because Jesus is your Savior. And when you believe it, you receive it. Eternal life in heaven. Uh, all right, brother. Uh, get, we'll give you the last word, and then we'll say goodbye. Bye. Well, the, the shortest verse in the Bible is, is Jesus wept. And there's another portion of Scripture that said uh, that... Uh, if anyone asks to be saved, Jesus said, Jesus will save them. And so I guess the, the shortest uh, uh, salvation prayer, all it needs to be is simply, Jesus save me. Three words is enough, it says in the scripture. And, uh, and so that's awful good news for anyone that wants to say those three words from your heart. All right, brother. Thanks again. It's always a joy to do these studies with you. Um, hopefully, our schedule will work out. Maybe we can do it again tomorrow, okay? Um, viewers, uh, thank you for watching, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.